Um, we're just so excited that you're here. And um, more importantly, we're excited that God wanted you here and made sure you got it here. So, yay. I'm going to start us off with a prayer. Um, I'm going to use a book called We Pray With Her. And um, it's written for um, women who are leaders or have responsibilities in the world. And it was written by a bunch of women who are under 40 years old. Um, so it's really, it's really a great resource for um, all genders to sort of to come to terms with um, life that sometimes hits you between the eyes and, um, and offers you an opportunity to connect with those who are um, on the journey with you and aren't afraid to say those things that we all need to say out loud. So, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, uncertainty makes me feel like the ground is shifting and balance is beyond my reach. This day calls for grace upon grace, grace that heals, grace that binds us together, grace that reminds us that we cannot do life alone, grace that connects and reconnects your diverse and beautiful people. Breathe into my weary soul, reviving me from doubt and fear. Enable me to catch on, catch up, and move forward. Walk near, for I am still searching for a firm foundation. Amen. Amen. I want to begin by uh, asking us to all thank the volunteers who put on the uh, meal for this evening. I tend to be someone, uh, when, I, when I do this kinds of things, I'm, I'm going to eat a little later, but it looks amazing. I also want to thank each and every one of you for coming tonight and making time in your busy schedules to be here. And I've had the incredible privilege of uh, knowing many of you at deep points of change in your lives, uh, times in which you've had to deal with uh, death, times in which you've had to deal with uh, major transitions, a, a sick relative or uh, a, 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 a major career change. Uh, I've been blessed to be with you um, during those times of deep change. And I want to tell you how grateful I am that you are here at this, uh, at this class. And, Many of you uh, I know, uh, some of you I don't know uh, uh, at all, and some of you I don't know well, but I, I believe I can vouch uh, for the people I know that uh, to tell you that you are in the room with some incredible people with, with incredible experience, and, and these people can be trusted. And establishing that trust is gonna be really important for us to get into this uh, material tonight because uh, as Chris uh, said, you know, uh, we, we're not going to, there's no tests on the literature that we're giving you today. Uh, we're going to be sharing with you four uh, basic images from a recent publication by David Brooks. David Brooks is known um, as an incredible writer for the New York Times and as an author of many books. And if I were to, in sweeping ways, just characterize his career, uh, David Brooks represents a kind of um, neocon. Um, he's someone who uh, was raised in a more liberal background in New York City, someone who was uh, Jewish in a secular way, and he is someone who uh, somewhere in around the 70s he had a kind of transition in his thought to focusing on communities and virtues and, and, and things that have come to be seen as conservative values. But then um, something happened the conservative movement that he was part of uh, began to uh, fissure and crack apart. Uh, you had the, the, the neocons, the theocons, and just the, and the paleocons, and, 
all of a sudden he found himself unable to kind of keep up with, with everything because he was trying to be even keeled. Um, he uh, came out very strongly against the current president, and so he experienced the kind of ostracization within the Republican Party that happens for the people that don't support the sitting president. So he felt this, suddenly, this experience of marginalization. His first marriage uh, broke apart uh, after he had demanded his first wife convert to Judaism. Um, that marriage ended in divorce, and then he found himself uh, married, he fell in love with an evangelical Christian, uh, and she was not going to be changing her religion anytime soon. And, uh, and so he, he, he had to kind of live into that space and, and find out what that was all about. So he's someone who, uh, when it came to picking up and writing this book, he had a, a lot of life experience to pull from. And uh, this book represents a kind of iteration of things that he's been working on in his life for the past decade or so. Uh, and he has been able to kind of crystallize these things around some key images. And I found this book helpful. Uh, I, I don't share many of the, 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 the background that David Brooks has, uh, but I found this book to be incredibly helpful because for me, uh, I'm trying to figure out what it means to be a true grown-up. Um, you know, I'm 54 years old, and I'm at that point in my life where uh, it's, it's a really interesting moment. My kids are old enough to be truly troublesome, and uh, my, my parents are elderly, and I'm kind of in that classic sandwich generation where I have to start to be the adult in the room with an 85-year-old teenager. Um, and. Um, and so, and, I, I, and, and of course, when you're in this kind of age period, you, uh, uh, you also are starting in a weird way. I don't know, I think I'm not alone because I listen to you. Uh, <laughs> you start to process like a lot of childhood trauma for some reason in your 50s. You're at that kind of point where you can finally start to kind of take note of this. And I believe that this is all uh, important. And I believe it's all of a moment because I actually think that our society is getting fewer and fewer images of what it means to be uh, fully adult in this world, to be truly grown up, to have a kind of sense of maturity. And I believe that these four images are going to help us get there. Now, I began by saying that I could vouch for all of you because uh, I, I believe that the only way you actually grow up is by being in community with one another. Um, one of the things that I'm researching a lot is uh, the role of, of shame and how it can inhibit our growth and inhibit us as people. And uh, one of the ways people get better <coughs> through therapy um, is they actually generate some narratives that pull together um, the left side of their brain, which is the rational side of their brain, with the right side of the brain, which is their emotive, affective, relational side of their brain. And that the, the narratives uh, that heal are the narratives that somehow bring those sides of the brain together. And you usually need a kind of supportive community. Um, now, I want to be clear, this is not therapy. <laughs> um, but, but I actually think that when you study the effects of therapy by many people, they'll are, they've, they've shown that it's, it's actually the empathy of the therapist that plays a key role in helping the patient develop a narrative that can reconcile the right brain and the left brain. So even though this is not therapy, if you need therapy, I have a whole Rolodex to help you of good people from Freudian analysis to cognitive behavioral therapy to Jungian analysis, I got it all. <clears throat> whatever, your, whatever your flavor is. But I actually think that there's a kind of therapeutic role for these small groups. These small groups are gonna help us actually play with that narrative because in order to play with that narrative you need to become vulnerable and you need some empathic uh, ears and faces around you. 
And so our goal today is to kind of move through these images over the course of, this, of these classes, to have you take these images and begin to think about them in your life. Um, they're not perfect. Uh, uh, they're, they're, David Brooks is, definitely has a view and a perspective that is um, due to his history and his own, his own perspectives. Uh, but we want you to maybe take those images and play with them and, and, and move through a bit of that reconciliation between the, the left side of your brain and the right side of your brain. The person who is able to be in relationship with others in a more authentic way. So that's the, that's the big, hairy, audacious goal of this class. And I am incredibly grateful uh, for you. Um, I, 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 because I, I just fear any questions at this point, I'm going to keep on going. So, and then, uh, and then uh, Chris is going to do uh, the break us up into our small groups. And then at the end, at a certain point, my hope is we can come back together and we'll do just a final assigned reading for next uh, week for those of you who are going to read this book. It's an easy read, uh, I promise you. It's a book you need to kind of read in a coffee shop and not with your feet up uh, in a hammock, but it is, um, it is an easy read. So if you go to page one of the handout I have, I'm going to read what I think is the key, um, the key passage that we're going to use, and I'm going to put in one more passage, and then I'll introduce the questions. So early on in the book, uh, Brooks uh, poses the question, have you ever met a person who radiates joy, someone who truly shines? And, uh, and the kind of joy that he's talking about is not simply someone who is at home or at peace or, or has a kind of uh, stillness, but it's someone who has actually kind of been through a passage and has that kind of, 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 of serenity or sobriety, as the 12-step program would say. And this is what he, 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 he wrote in response to that description of that joyful person. I often find that their life has, had, has what I think of as a two-mountain shape. They got out of school, began their career, or started a family, and identified the mountain they thought they were meant to climb. I'm going to be a cop, a doctor, an entrepreneur, what have you. On the first mountain, we all have to perform certain life tasks, establish an identity, separate from our parents, cultivate our talents, build a secure ego, and try to make a mark in the world. People climbing that first mountain spend a lot of time thinking about reputation management. They're always keeping score. How do I measure up? Where do I rank? As the psychologist James Hollis puts it, at that stage, we have a tendency to think, I am what the world says I am. The goals on that first mountain are the normal goals that our culture endorses. To be a success, to be well thought of, to get invited into the right social circles, and to experience personal happiness. It's all the normal stuff. Nice home, nice family, nice vacations, good food, good friends, and so on. Then, something happens. Some people get to the top of that first mountain, taste success, and find it unsatisfying. Is this all there is, they wonder. They sense there must be a deeper journey they can take. Other people get knocked off that mountain by some failure. Something happens to their career, their family, or their reputation. Suddenly, life doesn't look like a steady ascent up. The ascent up the mountain of success, it has a different and more disappointing shape. For still others, something unexpected happens that knocks them crossways, the death of a child, or cancer scare, a struggle with addiction, and some life-altering tragedy that was not part of the original plan. Whatever the cause, these people are no longer on the mountain. They are down in the valley of bewilderment or suffering. This can happen at any age, by the way. From eight to 85 and beyond. It's never too early or too late to get knocked off your first mountain. These seasons of suffering have a way of exposing the deepest parts of ourselves and reminding us that we're not the people we thought we were. 
People in the valley have been broken open. They have been reminded that they, they are not just the parts of themselves that they put on display. There is another layer to them they have been neglecting, a substrate where the dark wounds and most powerful yearnings live. Some shrivel in the face of this kind of suffering. They seem to get more afraid and more resentful. They shrink away from their inner depths of fear. Their lives become smaller and lonelier. We all know old people who nurse eternal grievances. They don't get the respect they deserve. They live their lives as an endless tantrum about some wrong done to them long ago. But for others, this valley is the making of them. The season of suffering interrupts the superficial flow of everyday life. They see deeper into themselves and realize that down in the substrate, flowing from all the tender places, there is a fundamental ability to care, a yearning to transcend the self and care for others. And when they have encountered this yearning, they are ready to become a whole person. They see familiar things with new eyes. They are finally able to love their neighbor as themselves, not as a slogan, but a practical reality. Their life is defined by how they react to their moment of greatest adversity. The people who are made larger by suffering go on to stage two small rebellions. First, they rebel against their ego ideal. When they were on their first mountain, their ego had some vision of what was, it was shooting for, some vision of prominence, pleasure, and success. Down in the valley, they lose interest in their ego ideal. Of course, afterwards, they still feel and sometimes succumb to their selfish desires. But overall, they realize the desires of the ego are never going to satisfy the deep regions they have discovered in themselves. They realize, as Henry Nouwen put it, that they are much better than their ego ideal. Mm. Second, they rebel against the mainstream culture. All their lives, they have been taking economics classes or living in a culture that teaches that human beings pursue self-interest, money, power, fame. But suddenly, they are not interested in what other people tell them to want. They want to want the things that are truly worth wanting. They elevate their desires. The world tells them to be a good consumer, but they want to be the one consumed by a moral cause. The world tells them to want independence, but they want interdependence, to be enmeshed in a web of warm relationships. The world tells them to want individual freedom, but they want intimacy, responsibility, and commitment. The world wants them to climb the ladder and pursue success, but they want to be a person for others. The magazines on the magazine rack want them to ask, what can I do to make myself happy? But they glimpse something bigger than personal happiness. The people who have been made larger by suffering are brave enough to let parts of their old self die. Down in the valley, their motivations changed. They've gone from self-centered to other-centered. At this point, people realize, oh, that first mountain wasn't my mountain after all. There's another bigger mountain out there that is actually my mountain. The second mountain is not the opposite of the first mountain. To climb it doesn't mean rejecting the first mountain. It's the journey after it. It's the more generous and satisfying phase of life. Some people radically alter their lives when this happens. They give up their law practices and move to Tibet. They quit their jobs as consultants and become teachers in inner city schools. Others stay in their basic fields but spend their time differently. I have a friend who built a successful business in the Central Valley of California. She still has her business but spends most of her time building preschools and health centers for the people who work in her company. She is on her second mountain. Still others stay in their same jobs and their same marriages, but are transformed. It's not about the self anymore, it's about a summons. 
If there are principles, their joy is in seeing their teachers shine. If they work in a company, they no longer see themselves as managers, but as mentors. Their energies are devoted to helping others get better. They want their organizations to be thick places where people find purpose, not thin places where people come just to draw a salary. So there is this first mountain and second mountain for Brooks. And the first mountain is about self-realization, and the second mountain is about self-offering. The one thing I want to stress about the difference between the two is we are going to have some tendencies, I think, particularly given that this is a church and people go to church and we hear a lot about being other regarding rather than self-centered, we're going to actually find ourselves naturally saying that the first mountain is bad. But if you read Brooks closely, he actually is not saying the first mountain is bad. He's just saying that the first mountain is not enough. That, that if we only spend our life focused on that first mountain, we will actually make ourselves miserable. Um, and then the second thing that's gonna, um, I'm gonna just jump ahead and just um, do a little bit of foreshadowing for one of the questions is for Brooks, obviously, because he is um, male from New York City, who is a go-getter, um, there's a very gendered way in which he understands that first mountain, right? It's to, to, to get a, a career. Um, I think that you can be, and this is me, and I'm going to just throw it out there. You can string me up if you want to. Um, I think that for many people, particularly in suburban places like us, the sacred object in their life is actually not their career. It's their children. <laughs> that's the, that's the, to have their, their children be successful, it's everything. It's their identity. And this is why we spend so much time on our children. Our children have become, in a sense, our sacred object. The, the, the goal that we're trying to attain, the mountain we're trying to climb. And so we have to keep that in mind as we go through this. I also want to finally say that this is an analogy, and it's not going to be perfect. Uh, one of the ways you can inhabit this analogy is just kind of look at that first. And I, I actually like the, the, you know, it's not about the self anymore. It's about a summons. Um, they are, they are, are, you know, those are the little teeny things that will help you maybe find through. And then uh, there's so many, he's always embedding things, and I'm happy to answer any questions about it. But he's always embedding both philosophy and psychology <coughs> and brings together often through the analogies that each of these writers employ. I want to say uh, one bit more, or kick out one piece about the difference between the first and second mountains. And this is what he writes, and I'm on page three. You don't climb the second mountain the way you climb the first mountain. You conquer your first mountain. You identify the summit, and you claw your way toward it. You are conquered by your second mountain. You surrender to some summons, and you do everything necessary to answer the call and address the problem or injustice that is in front of you. On the first mountain, you tend to be ambitious, strategic, and independent. On the second mountain, you tend to be relational, intimate, and relentless. You don't climb the second mountain the way you climb the first mountain. You conquer your first mountain. You identify the summit, and you claw your way toward it. You are conquered by your second mountain. You surrender to some summons and you do everything necessary to answer the call and address the problem or injustice that is in front of you. On the first mountain, you tend to be ambitious, strategic, and independent. On the second mountain, you tend to be relational, intimate, and independent. <clears throat> so that's the general introduction of this major analogy for tonight. Uh, I'm going to run ahead to some questions before we do the kind of movement into, into groups and just give them. So we are gonna ask you to split into groups and we have facilitators that are gonna be there to facilitate. And Chris is gonna introduce some rules for, for, the, for, for, for 
uh, constructive uh, group discussions, which are really important. Uh, but I want to just, I'm just going to go through the, the questions that I have and they're on page three and four. And I want to say right at the outset, if your group gets together and only gets through question one, it has not been a failure. Your, your time together has not been a failure. There's no, there's no test at the end of this. Um, and, and I believe each of you are going to get a chance to kind of interact in a, in a powerful way um, uh, with these questions. And, and you are going to you're going to have some time to think about them. I think, secondly, uh, as we get back together, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an assignment, and we're going to finish with a Bible reading with no exposition. We're just going to help you. Uh, number four, don't interrupt. Do our best to let folks say their full thoughts. It's real easy in conversation to get going quick and start interrupting each other. We do it all day long in meetings around here. I'm a, I'm a purveyor of it myself. Um, so, uh, studies show that we tend to not really hear the other person all the way through. We just hear the first few words and we start formulating our own response. Try to really listen to other folks in your group to really hear them out. And don't be afraid about some silence afterwards before responding. If the person is going on too long, the facilitator is there to help bring them to a point. <laughs> And let's try to all police each other on that, too. Um, number five, and this is a big one, is uh, the, the, let's not try to fix each other. There's going to be moments where we want to share something in our life, just like David Brooks shares about his divorce. And there's going to be a strong tendency, it's very natural, <laughs> nothing wrong with it, to want to say, you know, you should really do this. Or let me tell you how to fix that. Or let me tell you how you could solve that problem. Resist the urge to try to solve, fix, repair, and give advice. Let's just try to use this time to listen and, diff and be in community with each other in a new way. That's what being Christian is trying, that's what Christian community is about. We're trying to be with each other and try to truly listen without trying to fix and give advice and solve problems. And then lastly, I would say to that point, it's okay to offer appreciations and affirmations. Thank you for sharing that. Wow, I've experienced that too, and that took a lot of courage, and thank you for sharing that, it affirms me. Or I wanna affirm what you just said, because I, I, I also have felt that way in the past. So offer each other affirm affirmations and encouragement as you go. It's helpful to the group, and gives each other the sense of safe space, which is what we're trying to accomplish as we um, engage this important material. Okay, so if you have questions about those, or concerns about those, or maybe one or two that I didn't mention that, are, that you think are important, I'll, you can bring those up in your small group at the beginning, okay? And, and talk about them there. But I just wanted to offer those as the general rules of the road. Are we all good with those? Yep. Okay, great. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna break into groups, uh, nine groups. So I'm gonna count you off by nine, okay? We've done this before, 